UK's high standing in science and do this to the benefit of uh, the UK community and the wider world. What the Royal Society has done for me is to reaffirm my belief that I'm an effective scientist working in novel areas, training people well, but also to give me a massive boost in confidence that what I'm doing is of significance, not just to me, but to other people around me in society. I was elected at the tender age of uh, 36, and I have to say, I think initially I felt completely overawed, but I, the degree of friendship and collegiality and camaraderie within the Royal Society has been fantastic. So this is, this is part of my family now, no question. I remember when I was elected and signed the book and just that sensation of the extraordinary people who had stood before that very book and applied their signature to it. That was a very deeply emotional moment for me. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, Fellows, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the Royal Society, it's my privilege to welcome Your Majesty, our Royal Patron, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, and their Royal Highnesses, Prince William, the Princess Royal, and the Duke of Kent, our Royal Fellows, to this convocation of the Fellowship. At our tercentenary in 1960, Your Majesty and 
Her Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, honoured us with your presence. That you are both with us again for our 350th anniversary together with other Royal Fellows makes this a very special occasion indeed. The Royal Society was founded in 1660 under the patronage of King Charles II. He presented the mace, which lies on the table here. The Society's full title, as given in its charter of 1662, is the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. The Founder Fellows chose as their motto, Nullius in Verba, which translates roughly as don't accept authority on words alone. They were in revolt against medieval philosophy and were anxious to promote the new knowledge derived from observation and experiment. Our society is the oldest scientific academy in the Western world with a continuous existence. Its prime object is to promote excellent science. Its fellows come not just from the UK, but from the entire Commonwealth, and our network of contacts is worldwide. But it has, over the centuries, taken on other roles as well. And the movie shown earlier gave some flavor of our activities. And it is to this society that we now take great pleasure in admitting His Royal Highness, Prince William of Wales, as a Royal Fellow. And I ask the Executive Secretary, Stephen Cox, to read the citation. Thank you, President. The citation reads, His Royal Highness Prince William of Wales is elected a Royal Fellow of the Royal Society in recognition of his developing leadership role at national and international level, his active interest in science and technology, and his ability to stimulate interest in science and technology, particularly among young people. I should now like to invite His Royal Highness to sign the Charter Book and be ad formally admitted by the President. Your Majesty, Fellows of the Royal Society, to be standing here as the Royal Society's most junior fellow on the 350th anniversary of the founding of this, the world's most illustrious scientific body, is quite simply the most extraordinary honour for me. I have to say that if I look at the names of some of the great fellows, Boyle, Newton, Banks, Darwin, and our current president, Lord Rees, I realise the incredible history of this society. It's not just a great honour, it's also very exciting, as I'm acutely aware of how vital science is to the life of this nation and to the world. My generation will have to engage with science more fully, perhaps, than any that has preceded it. It will be through science, after all, that the world will meet and overcome the challenges of climate change, food security, water scarcity and pandemic disease. Science on its own, though, is not the whole answer. Its practice must be in partnership with this total engagement of my own and future generations. It is through the genius and example of the great scientists gathered here today and those like the University Research Fellows who will join our fellowship over the coming decades that ultimate success will, 
I'm sure, be achieved. It means a great deal to me to be following in the footsteps of not only the patron, my grandmother, but also my grandfather and father, who incidentally were both 29 years old when they were admitted to this society. I am 28, which just shows what a geography can, a degree can do. <laughs> I am so very proud of my family's long and close association with the society, and I'm equally proud to have been given the opportunity to carry on that great tradition. Thank you, fellows, for this great privilege. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, Fellows, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of us all, I thank Your Majesty for being here today and indeed for your supportive patronage of the Society throughout your reign. And let me also acclaim Prince William for his eloquent and thought-provoking speech. His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh is our senior fellow. He was elected in 1951, the same year when this building was completed, and his keen involvement ever since in science, engineering and technology has been an immense encouragement and stimulus, both in this country and throughout the Commonwealth. Prince William's Royal Fellowship forges a link with a new generation. We wish him an equally close involvement and an equally long sustained one. His words today have given us great encouragement. As you've been reminded already, the Royal Society doesn't overindulge in ceremonials of this kind. It's only every 50 years or so that we gather under one roof so many of our fellows and others who share the Society's mission. We especially welcome those who've come great distances to be here, and we're touched by the many goodwill messages that we've received from around the world. There are some differences between today's programme and the 1960 convocation. Then the President, Sir Cyril Hinchelwood, spoke for a whole hour. <laughs> and in this soundbite era, I promise to be much more succinct. But it is my privilege to have this platform for some much briefer thought. At the Society's earliest meetings in the 1660s, Christopher Wren, Robert Hooke, Robert Boyle, Samuel Pepys, and other ingenious and curious gentlemen, as they described themselves, viewed experiments of all kinds, sometimes rather gruesome ones, blood transfusions and the like. They peered through newly invented telescopes and microscopes. They heard travelers' tales and dissected weird animals. They were, in Francis Bacon's phrase, merchants of light, seeking knowledge for its own sake. Their curiosity seemed boundless. But for Bacon, discovery had a second motive what he called the relief of man's estate. And our founders were indeed immersed in the practical agenda of their era, improving navigation and the Navy, exploring the new world, and rebuilding London after the Great Fire. Hook and Wren, of course, particularly. 350 years later, human horizons have hugely expanded no new continents remain to be discovered. Our Earth no longer offers an open frontier, but indeed seems constricted and crowded, a pale blue dot in the immense cosmos. And the Royal Society itself is a vastly different institution. It's not just a club, still less a gentleman's club but its essence actually hasn't changed. 
Today's fellows and all the young scientists we support have the same motivations as their forebears. They probe nature and nature's laws for their intrinsic value. But their engagement with society and with public affairs is still strong. Though today's focus is not just on London, nor even on one nation, but often on issues that affect the entire world. For most of the society's history, its fellows were gentlemen amateurs. Indeed, there were few professional researchers anywhere before the 20th century. And the word scientist wasn't coined until 1840. An archetype of those gentlemen scientists was Joseph Banks, glowering formidably in the picture on your left. As a young man, he voyaged with Captain Cook to the South Pacific. Later, he became the society's president. And he held that office for 42 years. Modern presidents don't have Banks' staying power. They serve five-year terms. I'm delighted that four of my predecessors, Andrew Huxley, Michael Atiyah, Aaron Klug, are here today, along with my nominated successor, Paul Nurse. Nor do modern presidents have the financial resources of Joseph Banks. He subsidized the society from his own pocket. And we moved even further from the situation back in the 1690s when Charles Montague, later the Earl of Halifax, was president and was chancellor of the Exchequer at the same time. <laughs> well, the society today depends on a combination of private and public funding. And it's good to welcome here so many of those who've supported us. An even greater gentleman scientist portrayed here on the right is Charles Darwin. His anniversary was widely separated last year. His insights are pivotal to our understanding of all life on Earth and the vulnerability of our environment to human actions. 20th century scientists, our fellows prominent among them, have probed the complexities of living things and also the inanimate world, from atoms to stars. Collectively, they have much deepened our perspective on the world and our place in it. It's a cultural deprivation not to appreciate the panorama offered by modern cosmology and Darwinian evolution, the chain of emergent complexity leading from some still mysterious beginning to atoms, stars, and planets and how on our planet life emerged and evolved into a biosphere containing creatures with brains able to ponder the wonder of it all. This common understanding should transcend all national differences and all faiths too. Science is indeed a global culture. But it's more than culture. A former president, George Porter, a word that there are two kinds of science, applied and not yet applied. He was in effect echoing Francis Bacon's sentiment in different words. And of course the applications stemming from the insights of Newton, Faraday, Maxwell and Rutherford and from others on the distinguished roll call of our fellowship have transformed lives worldwide to an extent that our 17th century founders couldn't have conceived. Indeed, innovations happen with staggering speed. The World Wide Web is only 20 years old. We're proud to have its inventor, Tim Berners-Lee, as a fellow. Computers double their power every two years. Spin-offs from genetics could soon be as pervasive as those from the microchip have already been. The Royal Society embraces science in the broader sense to include technology and engineering. Its proud annals show the crucial importance of backing exceptional individuals in all those fields. And we must surely continue that tradition. I'd like to quote the words of another former president, Aaron Klug. I quote, the major insights in science 
come from people who have the patience to develop an, an intimate understanding of a problem, who have the space and the freedom to take professional risks, and who know how to make creative use of the surprises that they encounter when they do. These are the people whom we must nurture wherever we find them. We don't know what will be the 21st century counterparts of the electron, quantum theory, the double helix, and the computer, nor where the great innovators of the future will get their formative training and inspiration. But one thing seems clear. This country's standing depends on sustaining our edge as discoverers and innovators, on ensuring that some of the key creative ideas of the coming decades germinate and even more are exploited here in the UK. Scientific knowledge is public knowledge, and it's international. Indeed, Asia's contribution is rising spectacularly, and may in the next 50 years surpass the US and Europe. But science's benefits can only be captured by those who are educated and discerning enough. That's why it's in our national interest to maintain strong and broad expertise here. Our science is overall at least as strong as that of any 